Welcome to Eat Well, Travel Often, a podcast about food, travel, the environment, mind, body, and spirit. I'm Melissa Goldberg, and over the course of my adult life, I've been focused on how to build an integrated community around food, health, wellness, and the environment. These are all related. Understanding these interrelationships helps us look at life as a holistic system and teaches us how to connect with each other to create a loving and thriving community. On Eat Well, Travel Often, I talk to farmers, foragers, cookbook authors, doctors, scientists, and entrepreneurs. All have one thing in common. The people I speak with are trying to better everyone's lives through their work and passion. These are the people who inspire me to be a better person. I hope to share with you my curiosity from everything from book to plate. And the goal of these conversations are to inspire you to eat well and travel often. For this episode, I am speaking with John Kruger from Circle Book Farm. John and I have known each other for almost 10 years. Every summer, he provides my food cooperative with amazing vegetables. His farm is a diversified, certified organic vegetable farm. He grows almost every type of produce that is possible in our New Jersey climate. He specializes in heirloom varieties and even finds exotic varieties on his yearly trips to South and Central America. His core business is as a community-supported agriculture farmer, or CSA farmer. Members prepay for their produce prior to the season's start and become shareholders in the farm. Since working with John, he has seen ups and downs of the CSA model and also has had many hard times due to climate change. However, coronavirus is hitting him harder than anything he has faced in the past. Farming is hard business, and his fortitude and strength is amazing in these challenging times. As you listen, think about all the farmers out there that face these challenges, and be grateful to them every day to provide us with food on our table. All right. Welcome, John. Thanks for taking the time to talk to me. So farming, it's not a very glamorous career. Did you grow up wanting to be a farmer? Well, no, I don't think I grew up wanting to be a farmer. Uh, I became interested in gardening when I was in high school. Uh, I read a, uh, I read Rachel Carson's uh, Silent Spring and uh, became concerned about the uh, chemicals that we were using to grow our food. Uh, I've always enjoyed the outdoors and uh, been a nature lover and uh, was alarmed about the type of contamination that we were spreading around uh, the planet. Um, so I started uh, learning how to garden. Uh, I became a farmer uh, a bit later in life. Um, I uh, worked in construction and uh, for a number of years and uh, continued to be an avid gardener. So, um, but how did you decide to become an organic farmer? Like what made you choose that over industrial farming? Like what did you see the difference and how did you learn about it? Uh, well, as I said, it was from an environmental perspective. I, you know, I was only ever interested in, in organic, uh, gardening. Um, I, I went to school at, at Cook College, um, and, uh, over, over a number of years, I was involved with the, uh, the Cook Organic Gardening Club. And, uh, so it was always, uh, organic, um, agriculture that interested me. Uh, I got a degree in environmental science, but I took a number of courses that were related to to agriculture. Um, and I learned carpentry and um, and did uh, had a construction business for a while and worked as a manager of a construction company. Um, but uh, I I uh, through a little bit of serendipity, I uh, I found myself applying for a job as a farm manager in 1995 uh, for a farm here in North Jersey and uh, was able to um, sort of convert my knowledge of gardening uh, to farming on a somewhat larger scale. I started going to to conferences and uh, 
learning more about uh, equipment and 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 uh, food production on a larger scale. Uh, originally, you didn't own your f- farm, and now you do. How did that come about? Well, yeah, as I said, I worked as a farm manager for uh, six seasons for uh, a farm here, and uh, when the owner of that uh, operation closed up, um, I went out on my own, uh, working with an elderly gentleman uh, down the road that I had gotten to know, um, worked with him the first year, which was 2002. And then 2003, he let me take over his fields. I, um, I basically, um, was farming on rented and, and borrowed land and borrowed equipment for a few years. Um, after, uh, a, a few years in that location, uh, things were very difficult there. The, the, Fields were very small. They were surrounded by woods. They were down in valleys with heavy clay soils. And um, I had a lot of problems both with, uh, with uh, rainy uh, periods and with uh, uh, animals uh, destroying my crops. Um, I happened to um, run into another local farmer that I knew um, who had a 50-acre uh, farm in Andover. And uh, he was not really using much of it. Uh, So he offered me use of uh, some of his fields and I began farming here. Um, A few years later, I noticed that there was a a vacant house um, on the farm next door and got in touch with the owner and um, was able to arrange to rent the house and the barn um, for um, as a base of my operations and a few acres of fields. Uh, that were contiguous with the house. Um, so, I rented. Go ahead. I, I rented from 2008 until 2013, when he put the property back on the market. Uh, I had always known that he wanted to sell, and I was uh, trying to save my money. Um, I had was sort of looking for investors, trying to find uh, a way to be able to purchase the property. Um, when he put it back on on the market. Um, I had some money saved up. Uh, I approached the um, Farm Mar- Farm Credit East, which is uh, the big agricultural um, l- uh, lender. And uh, they looked at my, uh, my, my business and uh, my financials and, uh, you know, pretty much pr- approved the loan, uh, but told me I needed to come up with about $250,000 for down payment and, uh, and closing costs. And uh, I didn't have all of that. Um, so I approached my CSA members. At that time, I had about 700 members in my various CSA groups. And uh, I asked for people who would be willing to prepay for the 2014 season in November of 2013. And um, I was uh, able to get 90 of my members to pledge to do that, which gave me uh, the extra cash to be able to, uh, to cover my, uh, down payment. So let's talk about that. So people aren't usually aware where their food comes from and you have a different way of distributing your food. Um, you don't sell mostly to wholesale. You use a CSA. Can you talk about that? Like why you chose to be a CSA farmer and, um, what's different from a CSA farmer or, um, having members than going, to markets? Well, um, there's several different aspects, um, which, which make it advantageous. Uh, the first is that you begin getting money, uh, up front, um, members be begin registering in and, uh, paying for their seasonal shares in January, February, March of the season. Uh, which gives the farmer um, the capital that he needs to purchase seed, to purchase fertilizer, um, and uh, to pay perhaps to pay workers. In my case, uh, it, it enabled me to buy some equipment as well in order to be able to get uh, to get started. Um, so that's that's the one of the big advantages. A typical farmer goes to the bank and gets a and gets a loan and uh, uses that for his startup capital each season, and then uh, hopes that he has a good season and can pay off 
the loan uh, by the end of the year. And then the next season comes around and he goes back to the bank and, and borrows the money again. Well, let's step back. Let's just step back. A CSA, it's a community supported agriculture group. And some people may not know what that is. So basically what you're doing is people are prepaying for their what farm shares for the season, correct? And then they get the bounty of what you're doing. So you get the capital in advance. Is, is that a way, a great way to explain it? Yes. Yeah, the idea of, of, uh, of a CSA uh, is that the, um, the customer, the member, as we call them, um, uh, prepays for the share at the beginning of the season or, or pre-season, pre, pre-delivery anyway. Um, and also another aspect is that the member is sharing the risk with the farmer. Farming is uh, not only is it not a glamorous uh, bit occupation, but it's also uh, a very risky occupation. Um, and uh, weather can can cause crop losses uh, that can be um, can be devastating. So uh, CSA members understand that at any given year, um, the farmer might have a lot of bounty and they might get a really good value for their investment. In a bad year, it might be a little bit less. Uh, typically, weather-related problems affect one crop more than the other, and so it tends to balance out. One year it might be a bad year for tomatoes, but a great year for for lettuce and other crops like that. Um, and it might be um, it might be the reverse the following year. Um, but members accept basically what it what the farmer is able to grow. Uh, they accept seasonality. That's another big aspect of CSA farming. When you go to a market, you basically um, sell the things that people like. If you don't have uh, broccoli, for instance, all through the summertime, um, then you're not going to um, you're not going to get as much money. And on the other hand, if you grow a lot of something and people don't buy it, you take it to the market and then bring it home and it usually has to be thrown on the compost heap. Um, So with CSA, you know that you're going to be able to, you have pre-sold a lot of your vegetables so that you know that they they are are not going to go to waste. Let's talk about the process. It's now almost April. um, And what, what's happening on the farm and what does the next couple months look like for you? In a typical year, not a coronavirus year yet. <laughs> yeah, well, it's uh, corona. The COVID problem is not really affect what we need to do out in the fields. Um, it's affecting our ability um, to do that um, because of uh, issues getting workers here. But typically, um, we've been busy in the greenhouse um, since at least early March. We did start a few things in February. Uh, in a little greenhouse that I built onto my back porch, which is easier to keep heated. But we were basically, March is a a big greenhouse month. We've been um, planting all our tomatoes and peppers and eggplants, uh, as well as transplant uh, stock for uh, cool weather crops like broccoli and cabbage, cauliflower. Um, We have lots of onions that that we've been growing. Typically, uh, in early April, depending on what the weather is going to allow, uh, we start planting the first crops out in the field. The earliest crops that go in are uh, peas, uh, parsnips, spinach. Um, Very soon, we'll be planting potatoes. um, And then we'll also be starting to transplant our onions out into the field as well. after that, we start doing more direct seeded crops like carrots and beets, and uh, in uh, in ju- usually in uh, early May, we're able to start transplanting out some of the warm weather crops um, like tomatoes and eggplant. So that's basically what what the spring looks like. And you're an organic farmer. Can you talk about the difference between organic and conventional, and why it matters? 
Well, um, as I said uh, initially, I, I, I became concerned with with the pesticides being used in conventional agriculture and uh, felt that we needed to find safer, um, cleaner ways to grow our food. Uh, as I got more into organic agriculture, um, I began to realize that there was a little bit more to it than that. Um, that's sort of reductionist thinking. That's sort of saying, well, if you eliminate this uh, and replace it with this other thing, then, then that's going to make a difference. The, the real difference, you can think of organic farming as, as biological farming, or farming with nature. Um, and part of that is the understanding that the soil, um, a, a real soil, a soil as you would find in a forest or in a typical natural setting, is actually an ecosystem. It's, um, it's a complex web of soil microorganisms, uh, fungus, uh, fungi, bacteria, um, actinomycetes. There's just a, a whole a world of, uh, of creatures that live in the soil and create a very complex um, uh, ecosystem. Uh, earthworms, of course, one of the larger parts of that ecosystem, but uh, the major part of it are very are microscopic um, types of bacteria and, uh, and, as I said, fungi. And organic farmers try to preserve that life in the soil. Um, we, we find that if you have a rich, healthy soil, that you don't have the kind of disease issues that, um, that plague conventional farming. Um, it's not only the, the pesticides and the herbicides that um, are used that destroy the life of the soil, um, but it's actually the fertilizers, the chemical fertilizers, which also uh, kill the life. And once the soil becomes dead, that opens up a, a niche for, for harmful types of bacteria and creates more disease pressure. Um, there's research that shows that the nitrates that are in the leaves of, um, of the plants are, are different from the chemical um, uh, when, they, when they're coming from chemical fertilizers and actually attract insects to those plants. I actually even read recently that the microbiome in the soil has an effect on the microbiome in our guts. So what we're eating is coming since the microbiome, the, if there's no, in conventional farming, the microbiome in the soil is not good. So then we're eating that and it's ruining it in our guts. Have you ever heard of that? Uh, yes. Actually, I mean, the understanding of our own uh, intestinal flora and fauna um, has sort of paralleled our understanding of, of the biology of the soil, the microbiology of the soil. And, uh, and that has also included a realization that there is an interaction with, um, with some of the bacteria and, and other things that we're exposed to from the soil uh, that actually help our bodies to develop resistance to other types of pathogens. Uh, the other aspect of biological farming that's become more and more uh, recognized and important, Rodale Institute's been, uh, been a leader in, in doing organic research for many years, and uh, they've been following the carbon cycle. And uh, we've come to realize that, um, that not only can agricultural um, uh, mitigate uh, that agriculture can mitigate um, the effects of um, uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and climate change by sequestering um, sequestering carbon in the soil. I mean, all forms of life essentially are carbon-based life forms. So if you have a rich organic soil, they are tire tying up lots of carbon. So how expensive is how much more expensive is it to grow organic than conventional farming? And does that really show in the price of the food or your food? Because it is it true cost? Well, um, I, mean, I guess part of it is, is is supply and demand in terms of what the you know what the value of the uh, of the produce is. But it is more expensive to grow organically. Um, organic. Um, to, to get your fertility 
from organic sources uh, can be more expensive. Um, and some of the, we do use some spray materials that are naturally derived and are quick to break down and relatively harmless uh, to, to humans. Um, but um, a big part of the added expense uh, is that we don't have herbicides uh, in our in our uh, in our toolbox, and so that therefore organic requires uh, a larger uh, degree of hand labor um, to um, keep the weeds under control. So we use only mechanical cultivation and uh, and hand uh, and hand hoeing and uh, weed removal. So that. Uh, adds a huge labor cost to the cost of the um, of producing organic food. You um, most conventional farmers grow one or two crops. You grow hundreds. How many different types of crops do you grow on your farm? Uh, I haven't ever sat down to count, but I would say probably in the hundreds, um, at least probably a hundred or so different. Uh, different uh types of crops and then within that there are many different uh varieties um we're we're very uh big on heirloom vegetables so for instance i grow 60 different 60 or more different types of tomatoes um we grow 20 or so different types of potatoes um lots of different types of lettuces uh but since we do this a csa program and we do markets um, we we basically try to grow every every type of crop that will grow in our in our environment. And I've even brought a few uh, few crops from uh, from South America that we're uh, we're trying to to produce here. You've been a, a vegetable farmer for more than a decade, and you've been working with CSA for about what fifteen years or so. Um, how has the CSA program changed and has your member taste changed over the years? Um, well, the, um, the CSA model uh, seems to be in decline at the moment. Um, we, I started with my first CSA group in Montclair in 2003 and uh, my membership grew very rapidly. Uh, I experienced, I added a group or two different uh, pickup sites uh, every season from 2003 uh, up until 2013 for 10 years. We went from 40 in, um, in 2003, 40 members to uh, 700 in 2013. And in 2014, we got up to almost 800. Um, after that, the membership began to decline um, we went down to 700, then down to 600. And, uh, currently I think, uh, last year we had around 500 members. Um, there's a few different, um, reasons for that, I guess. Um, I think there was more competition for a time for, um, for CSA members, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot more farms started offering CSA programs and addition uh, some farm stands that were really just retailers, buyers, and sellers offered a similar box share program, uh, and they were able to offer a lot more flexibility in terms of payment and uh, and in terms of taking time off, um, skipping weeks. Um, so that um, was was some competition there. And I think people sought out the CSAs because of um, – at that time, it was harder to find organic produce in the st in the stores. Um, now there are, there's a lot more organic produce in the supermarkets, and there are a lot more online providers of uh, of organic produce, uh, Fresh Direct, and uh, and then now of course you've got all the meal programs which people are um, subscribing to the meal kits. Um, so, and I guess there's a sort of a, a demographic shift. Uh, I think that um, the the members for many years were uh, were baby boomer generation, who um, at this point their their children have grown and have left 
the house and then it's just uh it's just the the husband and wife and they don't have a need for as much food maybe they're traveling more um so um that's been i think a big part of the decline in csa membership so we now have these big organic farms like in california who are growing you know we can get it all in whole foods or even in shop you know in all our supermarkets but is that true organic farming because they're just organic monoculture farms is it even helping the soil is it the full cycle i mean you you have so many crops and they're feeding off each other and you get the bugs and the bees. Do these farms, are they even considered true organic? Well, uh, I think any move away from um, the use of, uh, of large amounts of, of uh, pesticides and, and of chemical fertilizer is a good thing. Um, I don't think that they are, um, producing food in a necessarily uh, ecological or environmentally um, beneficial way, because as you say, they are monocultures. Um, the, the, the industrial organic from California uh, tends to be um, more of what I referred to early as a reductionist approach, which is that you just eliminate your chemical fertilizer and you replace it with a, some natural source of fertility, and then you switch to a naturally derived uh, spray material to control your insects. Um, I don't think that the vast majority are really paying attention to uh, actually uh, building the life in the soil. Um, you know, a true organic farmer thinks of um, the, the slogan that we use is feed the soil, not the plants and take care of your microbiology, and the microbiology will take care of the plants. Uh, so we now have a, um, an approach to agriculture, which is going beyond organic, and we're, uh, it's being called regenerative agriculture. Um, and it's uh, what, I, what I say has a great potential uh, to mitigate um, the, um, the climate change uh, issues that we're, we're now facing. So we have been, what is it, locked down for two weeks right now so far for the coronavirus. Um, how are you dealing with this and what impact is this having on the farm? Well, um, it, these, are, these are uncertain times. Uh, my initial uh, thoughts when this began was that I should maybe cut back on my planting because uh, we don't know what will happen with the markets. Will I be able to sell my, my product at the markets? Uh, as I said, CSA membership has been in decline, and as a result, I've become more and more dependent on farmers' markets. And if the, the uh, farmers' market attendance is off and, or markets are actually closed, um, I, I may not be able to sell some of what I've grown. Um, but... That thought passed very quickly because uh, at this time, local agriculture is going to become even more important than ever. Um, I think that um, we have definite um, possibility of interruptions of the supply chain. Uh, it's uncertain um, you know, how things will go on the California farms. Um, and um, I think that, you know, it's our responsibility uh, as farmers to try and grow as much food as we possibly can. There's also going to be uh, economic uh, disruption and more and more um, food scarcity and, um, and, and more need. And so if I'm unable to sell what I grow, then it'll be donated. It will, it will be put to good use. Uh, that being said, uh, I were having issues with uh, with getting my uh, getting workers here. I've uh, for ten years now. I've been bringing in guest workers from Guatemala and Nicaragua, and uh, unfortunately, uh, I was unable to uh, to get them here and in place before um, things started becoming difficult. Before travel became. became um, difficult. 
So it's currently uncertain uh, if and when I will be able to get uh, my crew of, of highly experienced workers here. Um, at this point, we are at asking for volunteers from the CSA and from even from outside the CSA to help us get our season started. And uh, we're taking it one step at a time to see what develops. Um, I'm still hopeful of getting at least some of my workers here at some point, but I don't want to get behind with my planting. Um, so we're trying to get going, um, as I said, with some, a little bit of volunteer help. There um, have been massive job losses due to the COVID-19 pandemic. I think New York State reported that over 1 million new claims for unemployment um, have been uh, filed. Uh, if you cannot get the workers up for Latin America, are you going to hire local people? And how hard is it to learn to be a farmer labor? Like, can anybody do it? Like, what are you going to do? Uh, no, it's 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 there's actually a fair amount of skill involved uh, in 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 knowing how to how to trellis tomatoes and uh, how to know when a melon is ripe. Um, but it's also just efficiency and speed in harvesting. The biggest expense of um, and uh, the biggest part of the labor of vegetable production is is uh, is the harvest. Um, and uh, my workers are very uh, efficient and fast at picking beans and peas, at cutting and uh, bunching uh, greens, arugula, spinach. Um, root crops that are bunched. Um, this is all very time consuming uh, and it needs to be done um, quickly. Um, but more so than skill is, is just the, the, the stamina and the ability to endure um, spending uh, 10 or 12 hours a day uh, outside. Um, we start in the spring, conditions are still cold. Um, in, uh, as we move into the summer, um, we're working out in, in uh, often in very, very uh, difficult uh, high temperature conditions. Uh, you're in the sun. Uh, and then as we move back into the fall, we're back into cold weather. Um, when it's raining uh, and we need to harvest, we're out working in the rain. Um, so it, it, we, they're typically... Um, haven't seen too many um, Americans who are able to to do this kind of work. You're bent over, you're on your knees. Uh, it's it's very very difficult work. Um, and, and so I I know that there will be many unemployed people. Uh, I may need people to help do markets, um, and I'm I'm willing to hire um, people where I need them. Uh, I do have some, you know, local uh, people who, who work for me, uh, but they generally don't do the field work. Um, the other aspect of that is that they've, um, our government has already put in place um, aid for unemployed workers that essentially give them um, their full paycheck that they received previously. So it seems uncertain to me that people are going to want to come out and uh, give that up um, to work long hours under um, very difficult conditions. You mentioned to me before we started taping about um, there's will probably be restaurant workers, but they're not legal. Um, what are the issues with hiring these type of workers? Well, uh, typically um, the the, that workforce is typically undocumented, as you say, and um, the problem with that is that they generally need to be paid in cash. Um, there's just uh, no way for me to um, to pay out that those quantities of of uh, that that quantity uh, without being able to um, use that as a deduction on my taxes. Um, I have I bring 15 workers uh, from Guatemala and Nicaragua, as I said, and uh, I spend um, over three hundred thousand dollars a year. Uh, I pay them uh, in salaries. They're paid by check. They're given 1099s. 
I can declare all of that expense on my uh, my income uh, off, of, off of my income tax liability. Uh, paying people cash, I'm not able to do that. Right. So let's go to the talk about the food supply chain. Um, you know, many people think that the food supply chain is safe, that there's no matter what over the next six months or so, there will be groceries on the shelves stocked with fresh fruits and vegetables. How concerned are you about this? And do you think that you can fill, you know, with the farm, if you get enough workers, you can you know, help out on this and fill some of this void if it happens? Well, um, yeah, I'm. Uh, there may be some people who think that the, the uh, food supply chain is uh, is secure, but I think that there are a lot of people that are concerned uh, with the supply chain as well. Um, there's no flour on the shelves in the supermarkets right now. Uh, people are stockpiling canned goods and uh, and freezing meat and stockpiling a lot of things besides toilet paper. And um, the um, the seed companies uh, are experiencing an incredible surge in demand for seeds. Um, I went to order seeds from a company that I order from um, who, who typically ships the same day when you order uh, by two o'clock. And they are now shipping seven days out because they have 30,000 orders to fill. Um, so I think that there's a lot of concern um, among the general populace uh, about the security of our, our food supply chain. And um, I think that uh, that local agriculture uh, is going to be much more important and much more appreciated uh, in these challenging times. I was thinking that it's not even some of these conventional farms that have a lot of workers that they live in tight quarters and they're all together that if one person gets sick, it spreads through the whole group of workers. And then where are the workers going to come from? Yeah, that's, that's a big concern. When I, when I thought that I was still going to be able to get my workers here, um, that was one of the things that I was thinking about. Um, they do live together in, in a sort of bunk style, housing. Um, I have a, a two family house in the town of Newton nearby. Um, I have, uh, uh, seven workers upstairs and seven workers downstairs. Um, and, uh, there's two bathrooms, one up and down. Um, so they are in very, uh, close quarters. Uh, it was a concern to me how I would be able to keep my workers safe. And if, uh, one of them that did get sick, uh, how I would be able to separate them from from the other workers. Um, it's one of the things that I was uh, starting to uh, to explore with uh, with a local health center that I work with. Um, of course, at this point, uh, everything's on hold, so um, we're not really sure, uh, you know, how that's going to be uh, possible. One of my thoughts was that I might need to buy a uh, a camper. Or, or something along, along those lines um, in order to have a space to quarantine a worker if one of them did get sick. Um, so we're, we're, we're considering that possibility. If I see that, uh, that I am going to be able to get my workers uh, up here, I'll, I'll be looking for uh, to, um, to buy some sort of a camper or a mobile home to have a a space to, to separate a worker or two workers if they do get sick. Do you, um, is there any update from the government to see if these workers can come in or do they have any type of program that they can maybe bring them in and quarantine them for a certain amount of time or, or is it just silence right now? Well, the, there are a few different issues with, with workers, um, in general, uh, one is that um, many of them were waiting for their interviews at the embassy. A part of the process of bringing workers in um, um, with a visa, uh, it's, a, it's a long, complicated process, involves uh, being certified by the Department of Labor. And once you're certified, um, then you apply to um, immigration um, for permission. 
And once you have that permission, you, the workers need to go to the embassy in their the U.S. embassy in their local country for an interview. Um, many of the workers come from Mexico, and the embassies were shut down in in Mexico. Uh, may still be shut down. Um, at this point, they have um, decided to waive the interviews for workers who have been in the U.S. In, in previous years, certifying certifying them as returning workers and um, not um, uh, requiring the interview. In my case, um, the four workers from Nicaragua um, were unable to get their interviews uh, because the embassy was closed. The embassy has now reopened and they are scheduled for interviews this coming week. Um, there's very little doubt that they will be approved because they've all been here before. Um, my workers in Guatemala had their interviews on March 13th, and I had already bought tickets for all of them. I don't typically bring all of them um, at once. Uh, early in the season, we only need five or six workers, and then a few weeks later, I need uh, additional workers. But I wanted to get them all up here and in place, so I had bought tickets for all 11. Uh, three days before the first six were to arrive, the Guatemalan uh, government closed its borders and its airport. So the issue at this point, all of my workers will have visas. The problem is that they, are, they do not have transportation. Uh, it remains uh, unclear if and when Guatemala will open its airport. Uh, but when they do, there are no commercial flights. So what I'm working on now, um, I've already applied for um, the 11 workers for space on charter flights that, was be that were being organized by the Guatemalan, uh, by the embassy, the U.S. Embassy in Guatemala for um, repatriating Americans who were stranded there. Um, they, they give first priority, of course, to Americans, but uh, there was a possibility that there would be some extra seats. I haven't heard anything back on that. Um, my next uh, step is to, to try and contact uh, the Guatemalan uh, authorities uh, and see if uh, they can be a, of assistance in coordinating with various farms that are trying to get workers here and organize charter flights um, to get workers for various for my farm and for various other farms. Um, I may uh, have better luck contacting um, an airline and um, trying to get them to, uh, to facilitate that process. I would think that if that happens, they would quarantine them for a little bit once they got here, though. Or test, hopefully test them all, but I don't know. Now, an another question I have for you is, so once the CSA gets started, how there may be, you may have to think of a new way of distributing just for safety reasons. Have you thought about that? Because right now, you know, with my CSA and all the other ones, you know, everybody comes and it's kind of like a, a market where you pick out of the bin the different things. But I don't know if that's the way to go in the future or there may be another way. Have you thought about that? Uh, yes, I, I have been thinking about it um, and um, just um, sort of trying to follow uh, what the emerging um, thought and science around around this is. Um, but essentially, um, the the typical model that we use of sort of a bulk distribution, which, as you say, uh, requires people to go from tub to tub and uh, pick out the various items that are in the share for that week and, and, and bag it themselves uh, may not be able to work. Um, every one of my groups works it a little bit differently, but many of the larger groups have volunteers who spend uh, six hours or so through the course of a season, uh, several different volunteer shifts where they sit at the pickup site and uh, supervise the distribution. Um, that's going to be something that people are simply not going to be willing to do, um, I'm afraid. And then, of course, you have the, the, 
the, the question of whether somebody comes who is infected and touches something and somebody else touches that and, and, and picks up the, um, the contamination, picks up the virus. So uh, the only um, alternative, as far as I can see, is that uh, all of the shares will have to be pre-bagged. Whether um, the CSA uh, itself is able to, to, pre, to bag at the site or whether um, my workers here are going to have to, to bag, uh, pre-bag everything and we will ship everything in one in, in, in for, for individual um, packages. Um, that unfortunately, you know, one of the things that we've tried to do is, is give people choice on certain items. So you could go to a site and have a choice between kale and chard or um, to be able to pick out the kind of tomatoes you wanted or a lot of things like that. And that, that increases uh, people's satisfaction. Um, and th in this type of a scenario, um, that won't be possible. I would think, though, the way I see it with the CSA is that there's less hands going on the produce than if you went to the supermarket. You know, you go to the supermarket, you don't know if someone picked up that lettuce, put it down, did this, who from the what worker came by. I would think there it's it's less likely to get something from you because it goes basically from your workers into the bin to us. And then, you know, I would just think it would be a safer food supply chain than what we typically see in a supermarket. Yes. No, I, I agree with you. I think it, it, it's definitely um, a less risky option. People are going to be wanting to avoid um, supermarkets as much as possible. Um, it's, you know, it's much harder to, um, to achieve social distancing at a supermarket. Uh, many of the sites, your site, for instance, is open air. So that's, that's a big advantage. Um, but uh, there are, you know, there are, there are still risks and we're still, you know, trying to wrap our heads around um, how we have to deal with this. Um, and my initial thought was that I was going to be taking everyone's temperature uh, every day before they started work. Unfortunately, um, the science now is that we, you can be contagious, uh, asymptomatic, or you can be contagious before full-blown illness before a, uh, a fever manifests. So the, that's another difficulty. Um, obviously, workers are going to have to wear gloves. Um, obviously, we're going to have to be very diligent about disinfecting our tubs and, uh, and you know any type of a plastic surface. Apparently, this virus can live for a week or more on plastic and metal. Um, so there's uh, there's some concerns there. Um, you know, obviously there's concern about the about the drivers um, and and their contact with everything. So um, it's going to be a challenging year. There's there's no uh, there's no way around it. Well, if anybody could survive it, John, you can survive it because you've had many challenging years from rain to hurricanes, to, you know, all these things, so you can survive it. Um, you know, I've taken up so much of your time. I, you know how much I appreciate what you do. And I actually think that this year might be a good year for you. I mean, if you get your workers and you get um, the farm going and get things planting, I think that there's going to be a higher demand for what you do. And I think people are going to want to know where their food comes from and have a consistent amount of produce coming each week so they'll feel comfortable that it's they're getting it and you have eggs now too so i i i'm being positive about this and i'm optimistic and you know thank you so much for what you do i really appreciate it you basically you are the heart of what we need in this country so thank you thank you melissa yeah i i agree with you i think that um you know, this is, uh, has the potential to be uh, um, a great boon for local agriculture, and I hope that um, people will, will stick with it. Um, if we don't support the local farmers, uh, we won't have local farmers, and we will be susceptible and vulnerable the next time that there's some disruption in the, in the supply chain. Um, so it, it's very important. 
Um, I, I'm, we're going to do our best. We're going to grow as much food as we possibly can. And, uh, and I, and I think that, uh, it will all be, be put to good use. And thank you so much for everything that you do for us. All right. Thank you, John. And I will post information how people can join the CSA. And if they don't live in this, in New Jersey, how they can find other local sustainable farmers so they can support the local food system and, um, keep everybody fed. So thank you and, um, be well. For everyone listening, please take the time to see if there is a CSA in your area. By joining a CSA, you will get a consistent source of food weekly, and you will be helping out the farmers. We are all a community, and just like the doctors and nurses that are on the front lines of this pandemic, so are the farmers. They are our lifeline. Thank you, John, for taking the time to speak with me. As I said in my interview, I am grateful every day for the food you provide me and my community through my CSA, Farm and Fork Society. Please see the show notes on my website, eatwelltraveloften.net, where you will find info on how to find a CSA in your area. If you are local, I'll have information on how you can help John and his farm, or you can donate to purchase shares that I distribute to food pantries. There will also be information about Circle Book Farm. Please email me at melissa at eatwelltraveloften.net or hook up with me on Instagram and Facebook at Eat Well, Travel Often Podcast. Love to hear any interviews and recommendations you may have. Also on my website will be a mini documentary that I created of John. Thank you, eat well, and travel often. Just don't travel now. <laughs>